Now Habersham is proud to sponsor interviews with the candidates for the May 24th political primaries. We hope by viewing these personal interviews, you'll get to know the candidates who will be making decisions that impact your life, your family, and your livelihood here at the local and state level in Georgia. We hope you'll vote May 24th, and we hope you'll be more informed in that process by hearing from the candidates themselves in these one-on-one -on -one interviews sponsored by Now Habersham. Hello, this is Now Habersham, and today we're speaking with candidates for the May primary here in Habersham County and speaking with Gerald Johnson, hey, the incumbent chief magistrate judge here in Habersham County. Welcome, uh, Gerald. So let's uh, begin. What is your formal training that uh, you feel prepares you and makes you qualified to be magistrate judge? Well, I've spent, I started my career in 1989 here in Habersham County at the sheriff's office as a detention officer. And my love for the law really began there as a jailer. That's what we were known as back then, jailers. And uh, of course, some of the prisoners had other names for us, but uh, worked night shift and uh, had an opportunity while the prisoners were asleep to actually get into the law and start reading the law books and learning about uh, criminal procedures and, and all the things, you know, aspiring to be a deputy sheriff, uh, you know, moving forward from the jail. Um, from 1989 to prior to my appointment as chief magistrate in 2014, I've had many amazing opportunities to attend training, uh, law enforcement related training, law related training. Um, had the opportunity, Habersham County sent me to the police academy back then, which was at the University of Georgia, which I graduated with honors from there. Went on to achieve academic excellence as a criminal investigator. I've attended uh, crime scene investigations at the Central Piedmont College in Charlotte, North Carolina. And uh, just building on my law enforcement career up to becoming chief investigator in the Raven County Sheriff's Office, where I was in charge of, uh, uh, had the rank of captain, uh, was over 14 sworn personnel, uh, four civilian personnel, and uh, basically managed all the criminal investigations activities. Have you seen a change uh, and the duties uh, and uh, the proceedings of magistrate court from the past, or is it uh, typically consistent? The, the cases, the, the similarities in cases are the same, but you know, one of the things that I tried to do when I came in is I wanted to make it more user-friendly for all the litigants involved. So and when, when talking to the, or when I was interviewed by the Superior Court judges, I got the indication from them that they were wanting somebody in the position that would be there full time. And, and they knew that I was in a position to dedicate full time to that, which has actually turned out to be full time plus nights, weekends, and holidays, which is fine. And that's kind of what I'm used to coming from my other job. But, um, but going back, and we've spread court out so that, you know, it's more user friendly. And by doing that, we have uh, hearings every day which gives the litigants the opportunity because they have jobs, they have families, they have things that they need to tend to also. And the more cases that we can spread out during the week, it gives people the opportunity to get into court, have their case heard, have their decision rendered, and then they can go on about the rest of their day and the rest of their work week. Um, there are very few exceptions to that where a case will take longer than uh, on average, which an average case probably lasts maybe I would say between 45 minutes and an hour to give everybody an opportunity to have their evidence presented, presented and, and uh, give me the opportunity to apply the law and render a decision. But more specifically, what we're doing is we have what we call uh, initial appearance hearings, or first appearance hearings um, as needed, but also scheduled Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and on the weekends as needed. Uh, in addition to that, we also if there's any continuances, I've reserved Mondays and Fridays for continued, continued hearings and to handle the routine business that comes through the, the courts where uh, an example would be if you file a claim and uh, the defendant didn't file an answer, then that needs to be handled administratively in my office without a hearing. Um, Tuesdays we do pre-warrant hearings, which is basically when people come in uh, Whatever their dispute is, we make a determination whether or not to issue a warrant based on probable cause. Wednesday is a statement of claim, claims under $15,000. Uh, 
We hear those on Wednesday morning. Thursday is a little more active because we do the landlord-tenant disputes Thursday mornings. And Thursday afternoon, we hear deposit account fraud and county ordinance violations. Fridays, we reserve for committal hearings, which is people who are still incarcerated at the detention center and any other hearings that might have been continued from a previous week to keep the flow going and because of like attorney conflicts or that kind of thing. And in addition to all that, we also conduct hearings via uh, Skype, which is the teleconferencing and the data or the use of technology that I've been talking about where the prisoners that before that one of the changes we made, the prisoners had to be transported to the courthouse. And that was a process in itself because they had to be shackled per their protocol. They had to have leg irons and I mean, just basically chained up head to toe, transported in a vehicle from the sheriff's office to the courthouse and then from the courthouse back. We changed all that by using the teleconferencing because I can actually conduct those hearings via Skype, which is free. That's another positive. And, uh, you know, make sure that uh, their rights are protected and that they have a right. To, and we go into the issue of bond. If I can set them a bond, I, I do uh, via the teleconferencing. That would also save time, I guess. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And, and, and going with that same teleconferencing, what I've worked out with all the cities, which was a, a pretty intense um, well, it wasn't, I, I say intense, that's not a good word. It was a, it took a cooperative effort between all the municipalities, the sheriff's office and the magistrate court. Now that the officers, when they want to make an affidavit or an application for an arrest warrant, they can also do that via Skype from their respective venues. And uh, we also have utilized through cooperation with the clerk's office, a warrant program called Easy Warrant where they can make their affidavits online and by using online signatures, they can sign that with the password, it's, a, it's password protective, exclusive to their signature. They submit that, we administer the oath or affirmation via the Skype, and then once they articulate the facts and circumstances to support probable cause, and it matches up with what's in their affidavit, then if I determine there's probable cause, I sign the warrant, and then we electronically send that to the sheriff's office who maintains those arrest warrants. Um, with that said, not every affidavit, not every application gets uh, approved by me because if the facts and circumstances don't line up with the law, then we don't issue the warrant. Mm -hmm. But there's a, those are just some of the positive changes that I can tell you off the top of my head. Let me ask you a, a poignant question. Okay. <laughs> you typically, I guess, don't use juries in, your, in the magistrate court. That's correct. Uh, so you, you personally have to make these decisions. Well, it depends on the type of hearing we have. You know, we, we apply a different weight mm -hmm. to, um, or correction, a different standard depending on the type of hearing. For example, in the pre-warrant hearings, probable cause is the standard, which is by definition a set of facts and circumstances that would lead a reasonable and prudent person to believe that a crime has, is, or will be committed. Mm -hmm. Then I have to make a determination should we issue an arrest warrant or should we explore some alternative that might benefit both parties? I don't necessarily have to issue an arrest warrant if the parties can reach a resolution that everybody can feel is fair and, and appropriate. But with that said, I also have to take into account the public safety issue depending on what the facts and circumstances are. Small claims is a different uh, standard. It's a, based on a preponderance of the evidence. And of course, the rule of law always applies in every hearing. But when you think about a preponderance of the evidence, you think of the scales of justice and the analogy you gave of tipping mm -hmm. the scales one way or the other mm -hmm. takes 51% to win or lose your case. Mm -hmm. Whereas in the criminal, the end result, when it gets to state court or superior court, is proof beyond a reasonable doubt. Landlord tenant issues is a little more meticulous and would take a lot longer to explain because there are so many different issues you have to consider in uh, landlord-tenant disputes uh, and concerning dispossessory actions. The, the biggest challenge I have is where the standard of proof beyond a reasonable doubt does come into play, and those are the ones that weigh the heaviest on me because we do hear deposit account fraud cases, unless, of course, the defendant asks for a jury trial, which they have a right to, not only in deposit account fraud cases, but also in county ordinance cases. But the um, if they elect to give me the honor of hearing their case and deciding 
um, if the proof beyond a reasonable doubt is there with what we call a bench trial, then that's where the weight really is on my shoulders to try to make sure that everybody's rights are protected, that I'm applying the law fairly and substantially. And it's very difficult sometimes, especially in county ordinance violations, because they are misdemeanor violations. And, you know, once a person is adjudicated or found guilty, you know, based on that proof beyond a reasonable doubt, then I have to sentence them. We've been visiting with uh, Gerald Johnson, incumbent and uh, chief magistrate judge uh, for the election coming up on May 24th. Good luck to you. All right. Thank you, sir. This is now Habersham, and today we're speaking with Sumo Turlak. And want to welcome you to now Habersham. Uh, thank you, Sumo. Sir. Sumo is running for chief magistrate judge. Let's just start with a few questions. Let's talk a little bit, uh, Sumo, about your formal education and things that you learned in classrooms or uh, courses of that uh, sort that have prepared you for the chief magistrate judge position. Yes, I took uh, classes in Gainesville College. I had my associate degree there in Gainesville College as, with a criminal justice degree. And then I transferred to North Georgia College and State University. I took some more classes there as a major as a criminal justice as well. Uh, through the class uh, training, uh, there's several classes that I took, like the Constitution classes that I had taken, and also the criminal justice system. That would help me to prepare mm -hmm. uh, the proceeding, how to become a good law enforcement. Also, the due process that they had taught in class at North Georgia College, it helped me to understand what does it mean to process uh, cases. What about informal education? What are some things you've learned in your career or jobs you've had that you think might have uh, influenced you or might also prepare you for a position as the magistrate judge? Yes, definitely. I love Hammersham County citizens. That's the reason I want to do this. Uh, being out there, have a personal contact and relationship with the community, it 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 bring love, that that feeling that the God say you know, love your Lord with all your mind and love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, I feel that you know I'm out there treating people with love, and treat them as they are human, and that is the way you can become success in a community, because community. It's your boss, and you are willing to work with them side to side. Mm -hmm. As a magistrate judge, you might uh, or you will be called upon to make decisions uh, and conflicts. So what, what sort of values do you have that might influence you or help you make decisions as a judge? Um, being a judge, you look at three different things. One, is there a probable cause? Two. Is there a witness statement written, or do you have a witness to testify in court? And third, is there an evidence enough to charge the cage? That is the facts. You don't condemn people what they do. You only judge them on the facts that in the case. Mm -hmm. What about goals? You know, during election time, the, all the way from the presidential election down to the chief magistrate's judge election, uh, you know, we see people running for office and think, you know what, I'm going to run because I think there needs to be some changes. I think things need to be done a little bit differently. Have you thought about uh, what a goal might be of yours the first day in office? What would you do? What would you change? The reason why I run because uh, uh, a few, well, no, I don't want to say a few, a lot of businesses that have contacted me when the old judge had retired. And what happened was that uh, they have changed the civil process service. Uh, the old judge always tell me that, you know, you go out there and serve the people as much as you can and try to find to serve them. So right now the civil process has moved to the sheriff's office. Under the sheriff's office they have what they call a three stripes and you're out. Let me explain to what that is. If the business go out there and file a civil process. The deputy will go out three different times, three different hours, and one they could not find the people to serve, they return. What happened, the business people is the one that eat up the cost of the service. 
they have to refile again. My goal is that I want to make that priority is that if the business have different different um, address that we need to serve, what I could do, I'm going to sign it off and do a reservice for free. People in elected office might own businesses or have uh, ventures outside of serving in the office and which in some positions uh, they might actually profit from their decisions they make. So do you own any business that might be a conflict of interest with serving as the magistrate judge? Uh, no sir. I'm a poor man. <laughs> <laughs> I run my own campaign. Okay. I didn't slip any money from anybody. Mm -hmm. I do this because I believe strongly in education. Uh, our county has moved so far is who you know and how you get paid. And I do not own any businesses in this county or have any friend that own any businesses that I know of. But I always try to help our county to be a better place. That's what I love the most. Mm -hmm. Are you a registered voter? I am. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> I voted uh, as Republican since I was 18. Even as a uh, military overseas, mm -hmm. I still vote as Republican. All right. So some people may not know you, Sumo. Yes. So let's take just a moment to use some of this time for you to tell us a little bit about your interests, your volunteers, any organizations you're in, how you spend your time, anything you want to talk about your family or whether, uh, what are there other activities you have, just so people might get to know you a little bit better. Yes. I moved to Hammersham County 30 years ago. And at the time, uh, I graduated from Hammersham Central 1992, which I played football for uh, Coach Sammy Cunningham. Mm -hmm. I played football for Coach Larry Black, who we had took 1991 team undefeated. And remember, I was their running back number 47. <laughs> As Mr. Foster said, that uh, I get tired calling your name on the field. <laughs> so I'm not nobody new, I'm a native here. Mm -hmm. I married to my wife 10 years ago, and we have a little son named Alex who go to a level group school. Mm -hmm. So in the sense of who I am is that uh, I can describe to you in four words. God, country, my family, and the citizen of this county. Let me explain to you what I mean. Sure. God is my priority. That's who I believe strongly. That's what I went to the seminary school for. I want to serve the Lord. And I'm talking about the country. I'm talking about the Constitution that I believe in so strongly. That's why I went to the Navy to defend the Constitution. And hopefully I could defend our state Constitution as well if you give me the opportunity. Family, to me, that's the biggest goal. Without family, without the strong support of your wife, your uh, your uncles, your cousin, and the community, there's no there's no um, there's no word to describe it. You make it harder for the for the citizen of this county. It's, it's not it's, even though it's not last, but it's not uh, it's not least important. The city of the citizen of this Hammersham County is the more priority to me. That's why I had stick around in this county and served so long uh, for the for the citizen of Hammersham County. That's just my county. This is my home. This is where I will make uh, Hammersham County great. And I always tell people, God bless our Hammersham County. We've been speaking with Sumo Turlak a candidate for Chief Magistrate, Magistrate Judge in Haversham County. Sumo, good luck to you. Well, thank you, sir. All right. We hope you've benefited from these interviews sponsored by Now Haversham. And we want to remind you, be sure to vote May 24th.